Welcome to the Providence Church Podcast. This message is the second in a series about David. Pastor Dwight Lefevre talks about the power and value of friendship and how we can learn a lot from David's relationship with Jonathan. For more information about us, check out our website at provchurch.net. That's provchurch.net. Let's get into it. I know that there are a number of you who are perhaps Lord of the Rings fans. Like, so you've seen a movie, you've read a book, The, the Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, Two Towers, all, I mean, all, all the, the Frodo, Bilbo, Baggins, right? So there's a scene toward the end of the last movie where Sam and Frodo are on the final leg of their journey. They're, they're on the quest to cast the ring of power into the fires in the heart of Mount Doom. They have to destroy the ring and the evil that is surrounding that. And so Frodo, in this whole journey, he's losing heart. Uh, you know, after all the battles, they've been on the run, seems like forever. The orcs have been after them. Uh, he, he's been trying to remain hidden from Sauron, the, 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 the evil uh, force of evil, trying to remain hidden. He's had fights with Gollum. Uh, all, so he's just worn out, tired, discouraged, overwhelmed, and about out of courage. And that's when Sam, his faithful friend, reminds Frodo of some things. And he reminds him of the Shire. They were from the, the hobbits lived on the Shire, this idyllic scene, this uh, beautiful place of peace and tranquility and food and love and dances and village life together. He said, how good it will be to get back home again, Mr. Baggins. How good it will be to get back home again, Frodo. He reminds Frodo of their mission also and the calling they have to cast the ring into the fires of Mount Doom and destroy it forever. So when the chips are down, Sam steps up. When Frodo can't seem to take another step, Sam comes alongside. And, he, and here's the thing. Sam can't carry the ring for Frodo, but he can fill him with courage and get him on the way again. That's what a friend does. And the question, I guess, for all of us this morning is, do you have a friend like that in your life? Because you will be in that place where you will be lacking courage, where your strength will be sapped, where you will be overwhelmed and tired, spiritually speaking, maybe even physically speaking. And so do you have a friend like that? A friend who will find you in a dark place and remind you of who you are and what you're about. Someone who will speak courage into your life and get you going again. And the truth is, a lot of people don't have those kind of friends. Less and less people have few, if any, real friends that they can trust and turn to and talk to, especially in a hard time. And I think it's even worse for men. This isn't necessarily a message for men this morning. It's for all of us. But I think if, if you're a man, typically we're going to get it done. And, and a lot of men, not this is a generalization, but a lot of men are task oriented. Let's get whatever it is. Let's get it accomplished. And so, you know, doing things task oriented. And so on the relational side, sometimes it's hard for men to admit their need that I, I, I need some, some strength, I need some help, I need some courage, I need some, some, some understanding of some wisdom sometimes as I'm making this track up this mountain and it seems so hard and I'm not sure how to get there. We all need that. Brian Wilkerson said this, he said, your friendships, spiritual friendships, are as important to your spiritual development as your daily devotions and your weekly worship. That's a strong statement. I wrote that down. I was like, wow, I, that is lo loaded. That your friends, the, the people that you journey with in life as you're pursuing Christ, are every bit as important to you as your time with God and your time with others in worship. And I think it's just another leg of the stool, if you will. We need all that. We need the word, and we need worship together, and we need friends 
who will help us when it gets dark and hard and difficult along the way. Spiritual friends help each other find and follow God in all seasons of life. David learned the value of having a friend that he could always count on. His friendship with Jonathan, which is what we're going to look at this morning, his friendship with Jonathan is one of the most profound friendships in all of Scripture. You can, as you go through the Bible, there are, there are joinings. There are certain relationships that are close and connected. And David and Jonathan are perhaps uh, as connected and joined as, as any in Scripture. And we can learn a lot. So if you have your Bibles this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 18. There are several different sections we're going to look at here from 1 Samuel. Last week we were in 1 Samuel 17, which is the story of Goliath. We started with the battle and the shepherd boy, and the slingshot. But it wasn't really about the slingshot and the stones. I mean, yeah, he used one stone and stuck him, stunk him right in the forehead, cut his head off, done. But, it was about, it, but David made it clear throughout the narrative that this is God's victory, that God's the one bringing this, that this, is, that this Goliath, this giant, has, this uncircumcised Philistine has insulted the armies of the living God. This is his fight. And so we talked about that last week. So now we're picking it up after the battle. In fact, at the end of 17, if you look at end of 17, verse 57, it says, as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner, who's the general, took him and brought him before Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. Wouldn't that be something seen to see, you know, you're at, in your tent and here comes this young shepherd boy with the giant's head hanging, you know, holding the hair of his head. And so he says, whose son are you, young man? And David said, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. And so then chapter 18 begins, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, they were debriefing about what had happened out there on the battlefield. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Verse 4, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And verse 5, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. What a scene. These guys... Meet in the tent of the king. Saul had a son named Jonathan. And when David and Jonathan met one another, I don't, know, I don't know if they met before, but in this moment, there's something profound that happens and their hearts are drawn to one another as brothers. They were uh, almost, as you, as you, if you will, blood brothers. I don't know if you and you were kids. Did you ever make that little, you know, when you're seven, eight years old? Hey, we're, we're going to be blood brothers. And so you, you know, let's cut our fingers and rub them together. And, and then your blood, my blood. And so we're joined. We're blood brothers. I mean, that, that's like, I don't know if anybody else did that. Elementary school, that was a big thing, right? Blood brothers. Okay. That's kind of like, it, I love the phrasing there. They were, they were bound together. Actually, it says, literally, it says their spirit was bound with spirit. So something inside their hearts was connecting with one another. And the Bible says that Jonathan loved David as himself. And I love that phrasing because, you know, it, when we talk about the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So there's something about loving other people deeply that's at the heart of God's plan for our lives. And let me say this. You can love people deeply without making it inappropriate. There's been a lot of, as I was studying this week, this passage, these, these passages uh, through 1 Samuel, a lot of talk out there about the nature of David and Jonathan's relationship and how close were they. And, and so, you know, the whole, the, 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 the insinuation that maybe they were inappropriate and that's not the truth at all. In fact, there's a, a biblical term, uh, a Hebrew word called yada, which means knowing each other intimately. 
And we would say even Adam, Adam knew Eve, yada, as his wife. That's, his, this, that's not the Hebrew word that's used here. It's a Hebrew word used as friend to a friend. Nothing sexual about this relationship at all. I mean, David was a man's man. You know, Jonathan was a man's man. These guys, they love they their, the women in their lives. And so, but this was brother to brother, heart to heart. Jonathan sees God's hand on David already. And so in verse 4, he took off his robe and gave it to David along with his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt. And so this gesture actually suggests that David is, David, he's saying to David, is, it, you're more worthy than I am for the throne. I can see God's hand on your life. Now remember, in chapter 16, David is anointed by Samuel. He is going to be the next king of Israel. After Saul, he will inherit the throne. And Jonathan is the, actually in, in the line, he's the next one. He actually is the king's son. He's the prince of Israel. He should be the one assuming the throne. But he knows that God's hand's already working in this young man's life. And he's like, here, these, will, these belong to you. Humility is such an important mark of a great friendship. I can't stress that enough. Humility. It's not about ego. It's not about who is greater. It's not about who gets the credit. It's not about jealousy or envy. The friendship and their friendship, as we will see, their friendship was rooted in God and what God was doing in each of their lives and what God was doing in the nation of Israel. One of the commentators said this. He said, their relationship, David and Jonathan, was cemented by a common confidence in God's support for Israel and a common desire to be in the thick of whatever action is going on. They wanted to be there in that place. And I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, the essence of friendship is a common quest, a shared vision, and a unified mission. Those things bring us together. And when I think about being a part of the body of Christ, I'm so thankful for that because I, be, I believe that, you know, as God works in our hearts and he joins us around his mission and his desire to see people come to Christ and his desire to extend the kingdom of God in all places, we are friends. We're brothers and sisters in the family of God, but we're also friends, spiritual friends. And we've got lots of them. And I know we connect with certain people more than other people, but, but we're bound together by something greater than our own personal desires or likings. We are bound together by the Spirit of God. And he has a mission for us as his people. And so we are, you know, Jesus with his disciples in John 15 says, you know, I, I used to call you servants, but I, he said, now, John, John 15, I'm calling you friends. I, I'm calling you my friends because I'm revealing everything the Father has shown me I'm giving to you. So we are bound together in this. And I love that imagery. And that's kind of what's at play here between Jonathan. They, they have a common quest together to see God triumph. Don't miss this either. Jonathan is consistently presented as a great man. He was the equal of David in faith and courage, and he was exceedingly generous. In fact, if you go back in 1 Samuel, we're not, you don't have to go there now, but 1 Samuel 14, we're in the 18th chapter, but in 14, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they're fighting with the Philistines, and they're, they're in a kind of a place where they need to make a move because it's been they're, they're getting beaten. And so he said, Let, see that cliff? They, 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 there's this sheer cliff face. The Bible says Jonathan climbed the cliff face hand over hand up the side of this cliff with his armor bearer behind him. They went together. They got to the top. They confronted the enemy. He single-handedly wiped out 20 Philistines. His armor bearer came behind him and mopped up. And because of their courage and the, the great act, the exploit of taking on these Philistines one on 20, the whole army of Israel was, was, was catalyzed and they routed the Philistines. They were, they, were, they were inspired by the bravery of Jonathan and the courage of this man to fight to take on the enemy. 
So Jonathan had his own legendary status in Israel's ranks. So he is a great man as well. And that leads us to the first point this morning in our outline. And again, I'm indebted to Brian Wilkerson for some of these insights. First of all, what do friends do? Friends set the pace for one another. Need to know that first of all. Friends set the pace for one another. The first thing that friends do for each other is that they set the pace for each other when one is discouraged or afraid or tired or distracted or just plain lazy this friend leads the way and helps him or her along and even pulls them along when necessary sometimes you have to pull your friend along because they can't go on their own and your love for them compels you I'm going to help you whatever it takes it's kind of like, uh, I was reading this this week, it's kind of like drafting buddies. John, you're a bicyclist. John knows the power of drafting. You know, when you're, when you're on a bicycle or if you, even if you're in a race car and the lead gets out in front and the lead takes on the wind and kind of punches through the wind. And if you're able to, as a drafter, you get in behind the lead and you move with them. There's kind of a vacuum that's created around that so that the wind is coming around. So if you get it tuck in behind, you can, you don't have to pedal nearly as hard as the lead. You can draft off of the strength of the, is that right, John? Draft off the strength of the lead. See in race cars, right? Those guys are going on the track. They get up in behind them around because they've got that that, that energy, that strength, that they, they, they were able to conserve as they were drafting and then they moved around. Really cool principle. Two riders taking turns pulling each other can ride a lot faster and further than they could ever ride alone. And so I'm interested too, as I was thinking about that this week, in chapter 17... Where is Jonathan? He's in 14 doing this brave thing, but in 17, when, the, when Goliath comes out and the challenge is issued day after day for 40 days, we, we don't hear anything about Jonathan. Mysteriously, he was obviously, we think he was on the line with the army or, or he was near his father's tent, perhaps. But we don't see or hear anything about him in this account in 17. But David comes along, and with his courage and the help of God, his God who gives him the victory, David sets the pace for all of Israel. And Jonathan actually gets in on the blessing of David's bravery. So David's out in front. David's taking on the giant. You know, when Jonathan won his battle before, David was the beneficiary because Israel won the day and David was a part of Israel. But now David's out in front taking on the giant, and Jonathan's receiving the benefit. There will be seasons when you are setting the pace. When you are breaking the wind, not breaking wind, but when you're breaking the wind. I saw that in my notes. I thought I better clarify that, right? And your strength and your courage will be leading. And there will be also be seasons when you are depending on your friend or, and his courage or her wisdom or their support. And I was really thinking about that even a year and a half ago when I needed some time, some downtime to refuel and refresh. And so many of you were helping me in that journey and praying for me and sending cards and calling and checking in regularly. How are you doing? How can we encourage you? And that meant a lot to me when I didn't have the strength to break out in front and you were all, we'll go ahead. And I got in behind and drafted. That's a beautiful thing. And so there'll be seasons in your life when you're out ahead because you can be, and God has enabled you and equipped you, and there'll be other seasons when you need to come in behind and receive what your friend has to offer, or friends. That's a big truth. The second uh, word here this morning is that friends stay faithful. Let's go to chapter 19, first seven verses in chapter 19. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. Now, the backstory there at 18 is that Saul got jealous, right? You know the story. 
You know, David has, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. They started chanting that in the streets. David got the top billing. David was the Prince Charming. David was the man of favor. And so Saul got jealous and envious and wanted to do away with what he perceived to be a threat to his throne. And so we get down to chapter 19, and he says, kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David, verse 2, and warned him, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine, that giant. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel, and you saw it, and you were glad. He's reminding his father of what really happened, because he's in his delusion, in his, in his jealousy, he can't see straight. He can't see clearly anymore. Why then would you go and do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? So the Bible says in verse 6, Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Now, he didn't say for now, but that's what it turns out to be. So Jonathan called David, verse 7, and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before. Here's the thing. Friends stick by each other. They don't give up on each other when the journey gets long or gets tough or even dangerous. Jonathan was willing to go to bat for David to stand up for him when Saul is hell-bent, I'll use that word, hell-bent on killing him. And so he comes to his father and says, look, you're not seeing this clearly, dad. This, this man has been a, a great blessing to you and to all of Israel. He has made a way for us to have victory. He has, he has, he has been kind to you and shown you uh, his, his loyalty to you and to this kingdom. So why would you go and do this thing to him? And so, so sometimes friends in those places where it gets hard, they stick up for each other. They stand in that place. Look in chapter, let's go to chapter 20, because now we're going to roll over to this next section. And this is the famous scene where the arrows are shot at the end here. But let's start in verse 1. David again is on the run. Saul has broken his pledge again. He has been angered again. David has been successful again. He's won another battle again. Saul is raging again. And so David flees. Verse, verse, chapter 20, verse 1. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without confiding in me. Why would he hide this from me? It is not so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. I mean, this is desperate time. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you my friend. So David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon festival. I'm supposed to dine with the king, but let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? David's being brutally honest with Jonathan. He's sharing his heart with him. Never, Jonathan said, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. 
And then Jonathan said to David, by the, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Verse 14, David says, but show me unfailing kindness Excuse me, Jonathan says, but show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan was willing to put himself in danger to protect his dear friend David. In fact, later on in the passage, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but later on in chapter 20, when Jonathan is at the table with his father, David is, is absent because he's not sure what's going to happen. And, and it's, one day goes by, and okay, maybe he's ceremonially unclean. Maybe he couldn't show up because there was a, a cleanness law. Okay, he's purifying himself. He'll be back tomorrow. The next day comes, the next banqueting day comes, and he's not there again. And now Saul is, thinks something's up. And so he presses Jonathan about this, and Jonathan uh, tries to defend David, and Saul takes a spear and <laughs> hurls it at his son. And that's, the, that's, of course, the tipping point. He is determined to kill this man, David, even willing to hurl a spear at his own son, who's running cover for him. David's life and his problems were messy. But friends are faithful even when things get messy. And it will happen. In fact, it will, un it will most, most likely happen in your life where you will be in a friendship with someone and it will be tested. And will you stay faithful when it gets hard or when things start to spiral down or circumstances come and they seem really complicated and you're not sure how you're going to sort this out and how do, you, how do you remain faithful to this friend when things seem to be all chaos? It happens. The longer you live, the more of it you will encounter. I love Jonathan's response. He says, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you, even if it costs me. He risked the wrath of his father for his friend. Jonathan asked David for a big favor in that 14th verse. He says, show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord. As long as I live, do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. The word there is the great Old Testament word, chased. I've shared that with you many times. It is, the, it is the covenant love word of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's agape. Agape, covenant love, sacrificial love, deep love. In the Old Testament, it's agape here. In the Old Testament, it's hased. He says, show me hased, because that's what the Lord shows us. I need that from you, David, because I know one day you're going to be king. God has spoken it. And so when you're in power, remember me and my, my family. When you start to vanquish your enemies. So there's a faithfulness and a loyalty wrapped up in this love. Jonathan knows that David will be king. And, and perhaps, you know, they were able to share that scene from chapter 16 in their friendship when David may, may have confided to, to Jonathan about what Samuel had done in the anointing. But he asked David to show mercy to his descendants. And, and actually, you see that get fulfilled if you keep reading through 1 uh, Samuel into 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 9, there's this guy named Mephibosheth. Anybody remember his name? Mephibosheth. And he's a, a son of Jonathan. And he's crippled and lame. 
And as David is setting up his kingdom and he is actually uh, making sure that all the enemies are vanquished, he's asking around, is there anyone left from Jonathan, from Jonathan's household? I promised him kindness. Uh, oh, yeah, there's, there's this lame man, Mephibosheth, bring him. He, he's going to sit at my table every day from here on. He's going to come and live in the palace, and I will take care of him because I promised my friend that I would be faithful to his family all the way. And he did. He honored his word. And Mephibosheth gets the blessing of the, the covenant love that his friend has. Beautiful story. But friends, Stay faithful through the long haul. Friends, stay faithful through the pain. Friends, stay faithful through the difficulties. Friends, stay faithful through the mess. And there will be all those things. And God help us to be those kind of people. The third thing this morning as we come into the close here, friends, speak faith into each other's lives. Let's go down to chapter 23. One more segment couple verses from chapter 23. Again, you see this friendship keep going throughout the story. And now in verse 14, David is on the run again. In fact, um, verse 13, David and his men, about 600 in number, left Kayla and kept moving from place to place. Saul was chasing them. He's hunting him. And when Saul was told that David had escaped from Kalah, he did not go there. David stayed, verse 14, in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And look at verse 16. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh. And helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. David, as he is often doing in first. Samuel is on the run. He is like, in that sense, Frodo. He is tired. He is discouraged. He wants to give up. And here comes his friend to him in his moment of need when he's in the desert place. And I love the phrase. It's a powerful phrase. He helped, Jonathan helped him find strength in God. We need those kind of people in our lives. Every single one of us needs someone who will be there to help us find strength in God. In fact, we probably need a couple someones who will be that for us, men and women. How do you help a person find strength in God? The first thing, letter A, show up. <laughs> it's, not, it's not rocket science, show up. Jonathan purposely went to David in the wilderness. He risked his own life and his future for his friend again. His father is on the hunt. His father is searching and Jonathan doesn't care. My friend is in need. My friend is desperate. My friend is lonely. I need to go to my friend. And he goes to him in the wilderness. He shows up. When friends show up in your life, when you're in the middle of it, there is a powerful effect Something powerful happens. And what happens is the, the sense that now God knows where I am too. My friend found me, and my friend was sent by God. Again, spiritual friends. So God knows where I'm at. That's really important for us. That could happen in a hospital room. Could happen in a funeral home. Maybe a courtroom. A coffee shop a living room, to be with someone in their time of need. You can't put a price on that. Because when you're with someone in their time of need, you're reminding them that God knows where they are and that he's there too. You're going on, on in front on his behalf to, to help that person find strength in, in him, in God. I was so blessed earlier this winter. It was a hard situation. John, who Slager, who's one of our longtime CR folks, long hair, beard, you know, great guy. Love 
just came to know Christ through this, through this uh, time in his life, these last number of years, had cancer and was in the hospital dying. And Brad called in the morning and said, hey, can we get to the hospital? And so I got to the hospital and Brad was there and Jamie Stolfer was there too from CR. And those men stood around his hospital bed while he was taking his last breaths and prayed and came around his wife and his family. And that was, you could feel the presence of God in that place, hard place. Some of you have been in those hard places where you've stood with people in their, in their moment of need. Showing up really matters. Second word here is speak courage to them. What does Jonathan say to David? Don't be afraid, my friend, my brother. God has his hand on you. You will be king. David, Jonathan is reminding David of what God has already said. Friends speak courage and hope and confidence and faith into each other's lives. They tell stories of God's faithfulness. They, they reveal passages of scripture to one another. They point out the hand of God at work to one another. They're attentive to the work of God in each other's lives. That's what friends do. They pay attention. And they're there in those, in those moments to remind one another, men and women, this is what God's designed. This is what God wants to do. This is how God wants to work. This is what God has been up to in your life. And we speak that into each other's lives. Here's the thing. We never outgrow our need for daily exhortation. In fact, the deepest saints and the strongest leaders need comrades to strengthen their hands in God. We all do. And I love what Matt Woodley says. He says, if you don't realize your deep need for brothers and sisters in Christ to walk with you through life, not just for the good times, but to share the deepest parts of your life, then you may have one of two spiritual problems. The first problem would be that you don't realize you're in a battle, a battle for your heart. You're oblivious to the battle that is raging all around you. And this is a tragedy because it necessarily means that you're losing the battle. Another problem would be that you're in the battle, but you're not fighting it God's way. God's way is community. You're fighting it like the Lone Ranger. And that is not God's way to live. So I just want to encourage you this morning. All of us need friends like this. We do. We need people who will come alongside of us. I love the imagery. David and John, their hearts were knit together. So I'm praying that you have a friend or two or three or four or five like that in your life. And we want to be a church that's, that's committed to that. So if it's men's group or women's group or Bible study or Sunday school or life group, whatever, whatever like serving together. Serve, some of you are on serving teams together. And so you, you're engaging with one another in, in life and in relationship and conversation as you serve God together. You're on mission together. I love those moments. I'm looking forward to serve now again in a couple more weeks because we're going to get out there and we're going to do some stuff together. And in that process, we're loving one another. And we're helping one another. We're encouraging one another. Keep moving, brother. Keep going, sister. Let's just do this together. That's a really important truth. And so I'm thankful for a church family. And I want to just encourage you. Let's be that for each other. Thank you for listening to this latest sermon. For more Prof Church, check out our YouTube at Prof Church Lancaster. Follow us on Facebook at Prof Church Life. On Instagram at Prof Church. Or visit our website, profchurch.net. Thank you for listening and be sure to make it a great day.